In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we've got a, a, one of my... Uh, well, I, love the, I love the Gospel from this morning. The uh, story of the raising of the dead son of the widow of Nain. And um, I'm got, I've got four M's this morning. Um, morning, miracle, marveling, and money. How's that last one fit in? I'll tell you later. If you can stay awake long enough. All right, first of all, morning. Um, Jesus has just healed the servant of the centurion. And he is moving now to this city or this small town called Nain, which is about seven miles south of Nazareth. And um, it's only mentioned this one time in the whole of the scriptures. Um, but you can go there today. The city's, the town is still there today, and there's a little church there commemorating this event. Um, so he was on, on his way there, and we're told that uh, he had a, a, um, a large crowd went along with him. Probably they'd all heard about what he'd done with the servant of the centurion. So they were all attracted to this miracle, and they were going along with him. And as he was coming along towards the town of Nain, out of the city was coming another procession, uh, this time, though, a, uh, a mournful procession, because this mother, um, who was at the front of the procession, uh, was followed by her son's body on a, on a bier, B-I-E-R, not B-E-E-R, um, which is what they carried them on, to the cemetery. So you had a procession of life coming towards the procession of death. Which one's going to win? <laughs> and Jesus, um, um, we're told that he was the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And we're told that when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. For he had compassion on her. I, I really believe, and the, and the fathers will tell us this, that he would have been thinking ahead to the, to the time when he was going to be on the cross with his mother below him, already a widow, about to lose her son. And when he thought about this, he, he tell, tells us he had compassion on her. His heart went out to her. And he said, don't cry. Now, it's not a good idea to tell people who've just lost a very close relative, don't cry. It's not helpful. But, so how, how come Jesus could do it? Because he knew what he was going to do. So he could say, don't cry. It's going to be all right. And he really meant it, and he really could uh, make it all right. Because she was a widow and she was lost, lost her son, her only son, it says, that meant there was no social service or anything like we have nowadays. She was on her own. She was destitute. She was in a terrible situation. Um, but God was going to turn her sorrow into ecstasy. So now we have the miracle. So we had the morning, now the miracle. Jesus went up to the coffin. Now, um, and he, he touched it, first of all. He could have just said something, but he touched it. And this is a, there's a very important thing comes through here to us. We have here the, uh, the kissing icon uh, of the Theotokos on the left of the royal doors, where Jesus is actually kissing his mother. It's a lovely icon. It's a beautiful icon. And it shows us that Jesus, he's human. He likes touch. He's not just sort of standing back, giving commands or being remote. He, he actually wants physical touch, and he touches this beer. And then he says, I say to you, young man, I say to you, get up. And we're told that the dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him to his mother. He didn't just sat up. He didn't just sit up. He sat up and began to talk. Um, when somebody never ever talks, you wonder whether there's any life there. So it's interesting that it's recorded here that he sat up and talked. It showed that he really was alive again. Jesus had raised him from the dead. 
This is the first resurrection that Jesus brought about. The second one was Jairus' daughter, and the third one, of course, was Lazarus. He didn't have to touch uh, the beer, because when he, uh, he said to Lazarus, Lazarus, come out, didn't touch him at all. He just came forth at, at his command. But in this case, he touched the command. He, t- he touched the beer. And then he spoke. And then the boy was resurrected. And there's something here, I think, which is important. Touch is important. Christianity is not just, <clears throat> not just a spiritual faith. It evolves all the senses. When you come to church, you smell, you see, you hear, you touch with the communion. And uh, those of you who are online, especially, uh, it's good that we have the online because some people are sick. I know my own family is sick today, so they're watching online. But some people, don't be tempted... When, when the uh, lockdown's finished, the bishop actually uh, only allowed our church to have live streaming. All the others he stopped. Because he didn't want people to stay at home and think that that was their communion with God. Because there's no touch. If you don't come to church, you can't get communion. So those of you at home, if you're sick, God bless you. May he make you well soon. But if you're not sick, you should come to church. Because we have to touch God. He wants to touch us. And he does that through the body and blood of Christ. This is why we come to church. Not just to hear a sermon. Not just to hear songs. But to actually receive the body and blood of Christ. To touch Jesus. When the the procession of life hit the procession of death, life came into that procession of death. When we come to church to receive communion life comes into us and it's very important that we never forget that I just want to read one little thing from John 6 do you remember John chapter 6 Jesus said uh, that he, he was the bread of life he said most assuredly I say to you unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood you have no life in you it's a very, very essential part of our faith and of the Christian faith to receive the body and blood of Christ. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. This touch is so important. It's a very important part of our Christian faith. So that was the miracle. Um, Death cannot hold its subjects in the presence of Jesus. And we are in the presence of Jesus today. Life is in our midst. In in a way, we are the procession of death. We are outside in the world. And we are like the dead son carried on the bier through life, all heading without exception, to the cemetery, unfortunately. We're all heading for the cemetery since Adam and Eve rebelled against God. But we come towards the procession of life every Sunday when we come to church. Uh, I don't know if you can hold that picture in your minds every Sunday when you're coming to church. You're coming towards life. So that's um, the the first two points, uh, the morning and the miracle. And then lastly, the or thirdly, the marvel. Um, I've cheated a bit here because it doesn't say they marveled, but I went forward to chapter um, 9 in Luke uh, when Jesus, just after the transfiguration, he came down from the mountain and there was a boy who was um, uh, possessed by a devil, a demon, and he cast him out. And it says the people marveled. I think they probably did the same here, but they used a different word to describe it. So I've, called, I've said, it's the marvel. Uh, it says, actually, they were filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. And the news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. And it's not surprising. They hadn't had anybody raised from the dead for 900 years in Israel. That was the last time anybody was raised from the dead. So the news went out like wildfire to the whole region. So everybody knew that this has happened. 
It was good news, and they were very excited about it. Something supernatural had happened in their midst, and it gave them great hope for the future, because they were an oppressed people living under Roman occupation. They misunderstood what Jesus had come for, but the word went out. Wouldn't it be good if we could get the word out? <laughs> there's, a, there's a nation out there, it's getting less and less Christian. Uh, it's, it's just, I think it's just over 50% Christian at the moment. It was 100% Christian 100 years ago. It's down to 50%. We need to get the word out there somehow. And we need to do this. May God help us to do this so that it just goes out like there, like, like it did in those early days. So there we have it. The, um, the morning, the miracle, the marveling. And there, lastly, the money. <laughs> they say priests are always talking about money. But it's only the fourth point. And this comes from the epistle. Um, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And the Greek word there can be translated hilarious giver. You know, as you put your money into the collection, <laughs> this is my money. You know? <laughs> not, oh, I wish I wasn't that, didn't have to give this. <laughs> But I want to go back one verse before this passage, which was set for today. The St. Paul says here, Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. Um, I want to thank everybody for their generosity, first of all, because uh, you know we've raised... Uh, six, over $600,000 over the last few years for our building. It's not enough at, at the moment, unfortunately. There was a, a piece of land uh, on the corner of um, Blackburn Road and Wellington Road, which came up, three quarters of an acre, two old buildings on it, and just an empty piece of land. And I thought, yes, Lord, this is just what we need, right next to the university. Uh, it sold for $7.8 million dollars. Unbelievable. We have just tried to, um, we heard that the Uniting Church, where we went during the lockdowns, do you remember? We heard that that was, um, they're struggling down there to pay their bills. There's only a small group of elderly people there now. And I thought, if we could go there and buy the hall, make it our own hall, and set up an icon on stars, it's everything, make it our church, wouldn't that be wonderful? And so we made contact with them, and I thought we might, have to, we might have to raise about $2 million to buy that because it's in such a good location and everything. Uh, but it's come back, unfortunately. They said, we can rent it, yes, but if, it, if they decide to sell, it goes on the open market. So then the builders will come in and we'll be competing with them. So that's not going to work, unfortunately. But what I'm doing here today, talking to you about this, <clears throat> is the bishop really wants us to move out. I mean, this is a beautiful building and everything, but for, we have to trust that God is guiding him and God is guiding us to our own place, our own... We're going to build our future together somewhere. And we're going to need finance to do it. And you might think, oh, well, I haven't got any money. What can I do? Every little bit counts. Every little bit counts. The uh, committee have just read a... Uh, been reading a book... Uh, about, it's called Money Matters by somebody who's built two churches and we wanted to learn from him. And there was one story we read about Korea. There was a church in Korea that was being built and they ran out of money. There was a, uh, there was a big bad, bad financial time that the money stopped, the building stopped, everything. And the pastor was trying to work out how on earth can we, can we get this thing going again? And they had this big meeting and an old lady of 80 years old, little old Korean lady, came up and she asked if she could speak. And the pastor was very worried. He said, oh, I wonder, what, what are you going to say? You know? so I just want to talk. God's told me to do something. So she came up and she had a little, little uh, bundle in her hand. And she unwrapped it 
And she said, this, this rice bowl and these chopsticks have been handed down from generation to generation, and they're my most precious possession. And I want to give this to the fund. And the pastor was kind of, how's that going to help? <laughs> how's that going to help? Yeah, but, he, but he was kind of, he just stood there for a while. And then somebody in the congregation said, I'll buy the bowl for $30,000. And somebody said, somebody else said, I'll buy it for 50000 They raised $2 million that day. Just because that little old lady, 80 years old, gave her most precious possession to the church. And she gave it in the, in the manner that Jesus talked about here. She gave it, not grudgingly, or of necessity, and she gave it cheerfully. And it says that God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. And it ends up, the passage ends up, um, um, and by their prayer for you, who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. God has given us so much, so much. He's given us his only son, and he allowed him to be crucified for us so that we can be forgiven. I mean, can you think of a greater gift? And then he asks us to give of our, our means as well. And the response is, thanks be to God, not only for his great gift, but also for what God's going to do among us. God is going to do a miracle amongst us. He's going to do something amazing. I don't know what yet, but it's going to happen. The bush, bishop's pushing for it to happen. We're trying to make it happen. But in God's good time, it will happen. But you might think, I can't do anything. You can. If you've got a little little rice bowl, <laughs> bring it along. And God might multiply it like he did in Korea. Now to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, be ascribed all might, majesty, dominion and praise, now and forever, and to the ages of ages. Amen.